not just not just once. So. <clears throat> you have very nice weather here. It reminds me of Australia. In England, uh, when I came, uh, 16 degrees Celsius and uh, grey grey cloud, no sun. It's nicer here. I think they have better better weather. <laughs> How far from Ankara to the beach? To the seaside. Uh, the drive. The closest place would be around 250 kilometers. Oh, really? To the left. To north. Okay. north. Yes. That's still a long way. Yes. Never mind. <laughs> Oh, south. This is better. Black sea is not as nice. Okay, so ready to start? Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Uh, as you can tell, uh, my first language is English, so my, this presentation is entirely in English. I'm sorry about that. My Turkish shirt is non existent, um, but I will do my best to speak uh, slowly. Um, I don't think there's a simultaneous translation. Uh, but maybe there is, I don't know, I assume there's not. But. Uh, so this session is really about uh, proximity-based networking. So if you were in this morning's presentation, uh, you would have heard Bern, uh, who spoke here, uh, speaking about uh, all join and what facilities it brings. Um, and if you do have any questions about this technology uh, commercially, or you're interested in maybe trying to partner uh, with Qualcomm, who are the original developers, of all join, then Bernard is really the person to speak to. Uh, you may find Bernard is not able to answer your technical questions, uh, so if you have technical questions, feel, please feel free to ask me afterwards. But because also we are quite a small group, uh, if you have a question or there is something I present which is not clear to you, uh, don't hesitate to raise your hand and I will stop and we'll try and uh, uh, talk about the issue. So I hope that's, uh, that's helpful. Okay, let me start by telling you a little bit about my experience with proximity-based networking. So, I was at a conference uh, about uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, and it was a very boring conference. Uh, it was not very interesting. And my friend and I, my co now my colleague and I, we were sitting in, uh, in this conference, and we wanted to pass uh, notes to each other, uh, but uh, we didn't want to write them down. So we thought it would be fun uh, to uh, write them on the phone. But because we were in a, like underground, it was in a, almost like a bunker under, underneath, uh, we had no wireless signal. And because this was a, a, a conference uh, in Barcelona, where there was lots of uh, Wi-Fi networking going on and stuff like that, uh, we also had a problem with uh, getting a Wi-Fi connection. So it was not possible for us to send the text messages to each other. So what we ended up doing was we ended up typing in the notes using the notepad on the phone, we ended up uh, typing messages and passing the phone backwards and forwards between us to, uh, to make the communication possible. And afterwards we said, well this is really ridiculous. Why do we have to do this? We have a phone. Uh, the phone, is, uh, you know, the, the phone is, uh, has lots of radios in it. Surely there is some way that we can have something that lets us talk without having to connect to necessarily Wi-Fi or 3G. Must be something we can do. So we started to develop an application. Uh, and the application was called Whisper. And it was really about how you could pass notes to each other to people who are in the same area as you. Now, when we started to design this application, we came across a number of problems. The biggest problem we had was actually at the lower layers, how to make the communications possible at the, pro at the protocol level. Uh, and so we spent quite a lot of time trying to design a system which would enable us to communicate efficiently and effectively over uh, you know, Bluetooth, basically, or Wi-Fi if it was available. Um, so we also had big problems with cross-platform support. If you're going to design something to work on iOS, you, you want it also to be able to work on Android too. Uh, but the Bluetooth stack, the way it was designed on iOS, meant that it wasn't really feasible because it was used, we used GameKit to do the communication, but this wasn't compatible with what Android did. So it made for a big nightmare. So we thought, okay, okay, maybe to make it simple, we'll just we'll leave Android to one side and we'll concentrate on iOS because of the bigger market, so, uh, or at least uh, uh, market would make more money possibly. Uh, so we spent a lot of time worrying about that, but we ended up not, not doing it. Uh, how we deal with disconnections? You know, people come and people go, people walk out of the room, people come into the room. How do you deal with a situation where people are arriving and leaving all the time? Uh, and how do you support that uh, ended up to be a big challenge for us. 
So we spent a lot of time designing and working on this application, producing the application. We launched the application, um, and then WhatsApp was launched at the same sort of time, and uh, they did uh, okay. Uh, we we uh, had to make it free, the application, and then uh, yeah, it didn't do very well, unfortunately. But only, if only we'd been there six months earlier, we would have made, made a big difference. Uh, but one of the reasons, one of the things that held us back was having to do the, all the network protocol stuff ourself, ourselves. Uh, and if only all join had been available at the time, uh, maybe it would have been a faster market and therefore we would have made a bigger impact, etc. And maybe we would be WhatsApp instead, but uh, that's too much speculation. But anyway, so all join is really about solving exactly this sort of problem. Uh, that's really what all join is for. So what I'm going to do today is cover some topics, uh, really talk about what all join is, give you some background on that. Um, I'm going to look at some of the alternatives to all join because if you're a software developer, it's always worth looking at what else is available before you make a decision on what to commit to. So I'll, I'll sort of have a look at some of those. Uh, we'll look at some concepts to understand when you're looking at all join. Uh, there's some terminology you need to understand that's used. Uh, we'll have a look at uh, how you sort of map some Java code uh, to all join concepts so you can sort of see how that works uh, if you're doing Android development, which most of you will be. We'll have a little bit of a look at how you connect all join to Unity. Uh, because did, did anybody use Unity for development? No. Uh, Unity is a game development environment. Um, I'll talk more about that in another presentation. But basically, uh, if it's, it's kind of meant to accelerate game development. And finally, uh, there will be a chance to ask questions. As I said, if you want to interrupt me during the presentation, that's fine too, no problem. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll at least be able to say, oh, I know someone who knows the answer or I can find out uh, the answer from somebody else. Okay, so firstly, let's have a look at what all join is exactly. So as I suggested to you at the start, when I talked about this experience I had with uh, proximity-based network development, um, it's really about, there's a lot of friction if you come to develop uh, an application like this. There's a lot of uh, problems that you face. Um, if you're used to sort of dealing with uh, networking technologies, Things like ad hoc networking are not very easy to set up. They're quite difficult, particularly if you are uh, someone maybe who doesn't have as much experience with um, uh, computers. Setting up a laptop to laptop connection without a, a router, a Wi Fi router, is actually very difficult. Um, I can't explain to my parents how to do that. Um, sometimes I have problems doing it myself. I don't understand what's going on. So it's not easy for someone who's not an expert to understand how ad, ad, ad hoc networking works. The security that's offered in these networking technologies is often either complete or none at all. So you have either all security, everything the connection is completely secured, or it's not secured at all. And it's very much about securing the transport layer. It's not so much about securing app-to-app -app communication. That's very much left as an exercise to the developer. Uh, and as I'll talk about a bit later, uh, as soon as you leave security uh, to the developer, if you're a security expert, you know you're going to have a big problem. So, uh, mechanisms like pairing, which you might be familiar with if you do Bluetooth development, this is a very foreign concept to users. They don't understand why pairing is necessary. Sometimes it's necessary to type a passcode if I'm adding keyboard and mouse, you can't do anything with the mouse. So it's very confusing for users. Um, and why do I need a pairing code? If I'm, if I've got an app, I run an app, it's on this device, the app is on this device, what, why is the pairing important? Why is it needed? Why can't my app talk to this app? To, you know, same app, different devices. Why do I need to have a pairing set up? It's ridiculous. Not necessary. Um, once you've got the transport layer established, how do you discover the other devices? How do you find out where, which other devices there are? Um, on some network technologies, there are ways of doing that, but sometimes you have to roll your own. You have to find a discovery mechanism. You have to design it yourself, which is very uh, a lot of overhead and a lot of uh, delays your time to market. Once you have um, uh, discovered the device, how do you discover what it's running? How do you know what's there? How do you know that there's something on there that you can talk to? Uh, this is also a big challenge. How can you interoperate with devices that are on other platforms? I made a reference to this. If you've got, you know, if you, if you are designing an app today, honestly, I mean, this is an Android conference, I know. Uh, it's, Android is very important. You know, the most devices that are out there are running Android. Okay, but. The devices where people seem to be making the most money are running iOS. So you need to find
find some way, if, if you, you, you need to address both. You can't only concentrate on one. And any network technology you use has got to be able to, to do both. Um, as an application developer, I don't want to have to worry about radios. Okay, I don't care which radio is in place or which one's on or which one's off. I don't want to worry about this. This is something I want someone else to concern themselves about. I just want to worry about making my app talk to another app on another phone. I don't have to worry, want to have to worry about radios. Um, I, I don't want to have to rewrite my application if some new radio technology comes out. If NFC becomes popular, I don't want to have to write it again or change it to the lowest level and spend a lot of time doing the design again. This is a, a nuisance for me. So I need a technology that's going to be able to move smoothly onto a different, uh, different communication technology. What about when devices or services come and go? Um, you know, if, if a device decides it no longer wants to chat, I, I need to know and need to be tolerant of those conditions where people are coming and going. Sessions are established and torn down. I don't have to worry about designing all that code. Okay, so all join really is about making uh, this experience as a developer seamless and smooth and easy. It minimizes the friction that you experience when you come to design an application which is about peer-to-peer -peer communication in the local area. So really proximity-based networking is about we're in this room together, why do we need to talk to the internet? Okay, we just need, we can talk to each other like human beings, we talk to each other, uh, we can, our devices should be able to talk like that without going out outside, they should just really be, be able to communicate like this. Uh, so uh, all join smooths the path to discovery by uh, making abstra an abstraction of the network environment, making it more abstract. It adapts very well to apps or services arriving and departing. Uh, it performs very well on different transport protocols because it's transport protocol independent. Uh, and it interoperates across programming languages, across operating system environments, and across network barriers. And it allows information to be communicated in a secure fashion. So it has a security layer that you can optionally make use of in order to secure communications for sensitive data. The other great thing is that all join is, hang on, my device is not communicating peer-to-peer -peer very effectively. <laughs> Sorry, I think my, uh, I think PowerPoint has crashed. One second. I'll try again. There we go. Uh, so all joint is uh, open source. It's an application development framework and it enables straightforward implementation of ad hoc, proximity-based peer-to-peer networking on a wide variety of platforms. And because it's open source, it can be ported to even more platforms. So as new things come out and new devices arrive, all joint can be ported to those devices, which is great. So this block diagram here gives you a bit of a picture of what uh, all joint offers and the facilities that are uh, integrated into the framework. So it's available under Apache 2.0 license, so you don't have to release any changes you make to it. Um, so it's a friendly from that perspective. It allows you to integrate proximity P2P solutions easily into your application. Uh, straightforward discovery mechanism, uh, flexible security, and all those OS and um, radio bearers are abstracted away. So you don't have to worry about the technical details about what's going on under the hood. You can concentrate on making your application talk peer-to-peer -peer without having to worry about that. So the Android framework opens up a whole bunch of new possibilities. So if two people are in the same room, why do we need to talk to some third-party server that's in a different country? If I want to play a game, why am I talking to a server in the United States of America? Why is that, why is that necessary? Um, Instead of relying on proprietary communication mechanisms, it means that you can know exactly what's going on uh, in your, on your application, what it's talking to, and it's contained inside the room, basically, which is great. Um, why should the multi-user, the multi-screen experience, I don't know if you have an intelligent uh, TV at home, a smart TV or something at home. Uh, what I find is uh, very annoying is that if I have an iOS device, really the only thing it can really talk to effectively is an Apple TV. Why? Why is that necessary? Now, if I've got an Android device, it'll only, you know, it talks to things running the Google you know, software. It seems to me that we should be able to do better than that. 
we should be able to have a system where we're able to uh, communicate across these different vendors without needing to, uh, to tie ourselves to one vertical kind of vendor in this arrangement. Um, so the person who makes my set-top box shouldn't need to be the same person who's made my mobile device. Uh, this seems very uh, immature. If we are in a meeting, now we've all had this experience. You go to a meeting these days and you sit down and you want to work on a document. Everyone has a USB stick out and they're passing the USB stick around to copy the document between all the laptops in the room. Why? <laughs> it's crazy, right? We're in the same room. We all have radios on our laptops. We should be able to share and collaborate on documents very easily without needing to pass around USB sticks. It's crazy. It may all be floppy, floppy disks, you know? Um, so rapid communication with people who are nearby to you is what all join is all about. And I think it's a foundation of a whole new range of consumer experiences. Uh, but actually, what I, uh, something that occurred to me is that actually it's something that we've lost. We used to have this, but we kind of lost it. Uh, and the reason why is because it used to be infrared. If you remember, infrared used to be our way of sharing data between uh, people who were in the same area, right? Um, and we've lost that whole experience now. Now the only way of getting something to somebody else is go out to the internet and come back again, uh, which, is, which is kind of crazy. But I wanted to sh show you a little uh, video about something that we've lost. Uh, which the older people in the audience might remember, but if you're younger, you may not, you may not have, uh, have seen this. So uh, I'm sorry about the quality of the video. It's not the best quality, uh, but hopefully... Uh... <laughs> That's a very old ad. How many of you remember that? You've seen that before? Yeah, good. I, see that. I was expecting you to shout. You were? Good. Oh, good, good, good. I'm glad. Because when I saw this, when I did, did the presentation, I thought it was like, yeah, yeah, I knew. Yeah, I knew. I see the guys with the gray hair are the ones that uh, can remember, like me, like me. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I think we have lost this, unfortunately, because I think this was a very powerful thing, which unfortunately has gone, gone away. And it's something that I think there's a big opportunity for developers now to recapture that experience and to make things, these things possible. And we've had a few attempts to do it, but I think we're still looking for something that, that's really good. So as a developer, I think it's a great opportunity for you to, to look into that, to see how that kind of experience of being able to share just a little bit of information with other people um, like that is, is possible. All right, so in the next section, uh, let's have a little look at what the alternatives are to all join. What are the, some, some other things to try and address this issue? Uh, and, um, and we'll have a look at some of the alternative protocols. So here's a little block diagram to sort of show you some of the other things which uh, might be familiar to you. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the technology basis behind these so you understand a little bit more about uh, what all join brings that's different. So firstly, there's Bonjour. Now, Bonjour is um, Apple's kind of technique for discovery of uh, devices that are in the same sort of network area. Um, and Bonjour is quite effective, but the problem with Bonjour is, under the hood, it's multicast DNS. So all it's doing is implementing the discovery mechanism using a multicast DNS extension. Um, now it's great for knowing uh, what's there, and it is open, which is good, uh, but the problem is it doesn't help you much beyond discovery. Once you know that something else is out there, you still need to design the mechanism for how you're going to talk to each other, how you're going to establish sessions and stuff like that. Uh, so it's really about, about discovery, it's not about anything else. Now, UPnP was in some ways a very worthy attempt to address some of these problems. Uh, but the problem UPnP has was that it, it, there were two main issues. One of them is that it's quite heavyweight for low-end devices, so it uses a lot of SOAP and a lot of XML. Uh, the other big problem with it is that it also had a lot of security issues. Um, and if those of you who do sort of home network administration yourself will know that everyone says turn off UPnP, you know, 
as soon as you can. The reason why is because there were security issues in the past with that. So UPnP, unfortunately, um, and it is, it's also very device-centric, so it's also very much about how you get a device to talk to something else. Um, but uh, it's too heavyweight, I think, for what, you're, what we're looking for. Uh, DLNA um, was, again, a good way of trying to address some of the problems. It's basically a, a standards layer built on top of UPnP. Uh, and it inherits many of its weaknesses, unfortunately, because, of course, the security model is the same, uh, which is not great. The other thing is it's very much about home media consumption. So if you're trying to share music between two devices or something like that inside the house, it's, it's, it's okay, it addresses that you know, reasonably well. But the problem is we're dealing with a much more open space than that. This isn't just about home media consumption, although that's one way you could use the technology. We're talking about something that's much broader than that. So I think, again, uh, DLNA is not quite what, what, what you're looking for, and it, it's got quite a lot of weaknesses. Although support for things like streaming and security are quite good. Um, but these are all about device connections. And what we're really interested in, I think, is application connections. We're interested in how an application can talk to another application and not care about where it is, not care about where it is on the network. So let's look at some technical fundamentals then about all joiner. So at the foundation of the application framework is a distributed software bus. Now, those of you who are Linux developers or have sort of done Linux or KDE development in the past, um, Basically, uh, this uses the same desktop bus technology that's being used in KDE development. So this is effectively a, a multi-device version of the KDE desktop uh, bus, application bus environment. Um, on each device, basically, there is a daemon which runs, whose task it is to communicate with and maintain the presence of the software bus. Uh, now, in history, uh, on all join, you had to have a daemon which went on device to start up. Uh, but now the way all join is designed is it's bundled with your libraries so that when your application starts, it checks to see if there is an all join daemon running. But otherwise, it instantiates its own kind of lightweight daemon. Um, so applications on the device then talk to the daemon, and the daemons uh, worry about communicating with other devices. So it concerns itself with the network topology and how to get messages out and stuff like that, and you don't have to worry about it. So all the routing, uh, between devices and namespace management is all done by uh, the all joint daemon. Now the bus is formed ad hoc, and it's important to note that the discovery mechanism is not specified by all joint. So what it does is, is it plugs into a discovery mechanism if it's available. Uh, so things like um, Wi-Fi Direct, for example, have this thing called pre-association discovery, which enables you to kind of find out what services are being offered, and all joint plugs into that. Uh, whereas on Wi-Fi, you don't have that system, so it uses a multicast uh, distribution, message distribution, in order to find out what else is available. Uh, and equally on Bluetooth, it could use some similar, some similar mechanisms. Uh, but what this all comes down to is that all join is, uh, the all join protocol is transport independent. And as new transport uh, layers are invented, uh, all join can connect with those uh, very effectively, and your software doesn't have to change. So what does all join support, and what's currently in development? So uh, today, as you can see, uh, it's supported on a number of common platforms, uh, numerous language bindings, because it's also language independent and OS independent. Uh, so uh, you can work in your favorite language in order to use all join. Uh, and of course, because the source code is portable, it isn't just Qualcomm that makes new platforms available. Uh, you can do that yourselves um, if a new device comes out with a new operating system that you want to, 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 to use. And equally, if you have a favorite language of some kind, uh, Python, for example, uh, you can make the all join bindings available on Python or Lua or whatever it is that you like the most. Uh, you can see as well that Qualcomm continues to work on um, sort of language bindings, uh, particularly these ones here, JavaScript and, and C Sharp in general. Uh, these are sort of things that, that Qualcomm is working on internally and will be released in the not too distant future. So here's a little uh, sort of diagram that covers some of the earlier discussion uh, graphically. So remember, peers are not other devices in all join. Peers are other applications. And all of the application instances either communicate with a local daemon, which is running on the device, or they implement the daemon functionality themselves. And device networking and routing changes are all handled uh, by those daemons. So let's have a look about the bus format, look at the bus formation process and how that works. 
So this is a common use case, okay? You're exposing an application service on this bus. So how do you go about it? Well, the application service advertises the fact that that service is available. Uh, and it does that by calling into the daemon and advertising the name on the software bus. A corresponding call is then made by the client. So it makes a request to the bus to do a discovery. And then all join does the connection between the two. One of the key things to remember is that all join, in all join, is that the discovery process is dependent on the transport layer, as I said, Wi-Fi direct, pre-associated discovery, um, and on Wi-Fi, kind of a multicast mechanism. So once the connection is established via the formation mechanism, you have a single bus uh, which the devices can use, and they have a shared namespace. So peers can discover services they want to connect to. Uh, they can be informed when a peer joins or departs the bus. Uh, and peers can make uh, remote procedure calls, actually remote method invocation calls, because it's kind of designed around that OO sort of thing. Um, it's a stand they can also send and receive events using this mechanism. Uh, you can also you also have a facility to create a session, uh, to create sessions in order to uh, facilitate communication between groups of peers that are present on the bus. Uh, and this uh, allows you uh, all join to keep these device to device connections alive. And multicast events can then be sent to all peers which are in a given session, uh, which allows you to sort of establish effectively a secure session between a group of individuals who are in the same sort of context. Right, so let's get into a little more detail about the object model being used by all join. Uh, now, all join applications expose functionality via objects, which are usually arranged in a hierarchy of some kind. Uh, each of these objects implement interfaces. Uh, which can be named and which uh, can be several, not just one. And then these interfaces have uh, meth members that fall into three basic categories. So you've got your classic kind of OO methods where you make a call uh, of some kind of arguments and you receive some kind of return value. Secondly, you have signals which are um, asynchronous events and notifications which are asynchronous. Uh, and they don't have a return type, um, but they do kind of uh, have arguments that are sent out with a message. And finally, there's an extension to the kind of OO method, which is a getter and setter kind of methods, called, which, which are called properties in all join. Um, and they automatically handle the get and set operations for you. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, PowerPoint's crashed again. Um, so there's some special terminology that relates to the various components in the all joint system that you need to be aware of. So remember there's a daemon to handle communication issues. Um, and in the application memory space, you instantiate something called a bus attachment. Uh, now that bus attachment is your communications kind of uh, uh, establishment between you and the all joint daemon. So that's sort of how you, how you talk to it. Uh, bus objects are instances implementing the interfaces which I described earlier. So these are, have the kind of get the properties or the signals or the methods. Uh, and finally, you have what's called proxy bus objects. And a proxy bus object is a local representation of a remote bus object. Now, those of you who kind of may have done some CORBA programming or something like that in the past, may be kind of familiar with some of this type of terminology. Uh, basically, the way it works under the hood is you have a, an object which looks to you as if it is the object you're talking to remotely, uh, but it just pretends, it's just a shim, it just is a little thin layer. And when you call into it, those arguments get basically um, packed into a message which gets sent across the bus to the other side. The other side unpacks that and then feeds it out as if it were the actual object responding to it. So you have a clever system which basically means that you don't, uh, as a developer, you just behave as if you're talking to an object which is local. Under the hood, all join is dealing with all this packing, what's called marshalling and unmarshalling of, of arguments and stuff like that between the two ends. Um, so it's a, it's a very effective way of developing. Um, so let's have a look at some code snippets now. Now I apologise, fortunately we're a small group, but hopefully you can see this, this, these code snippets are quite large, but they get a bit smaller in font uh, over the next couple of slides. So I'm sorry about that, I hope your eyesight is good. Uh, so let's have a look at these code snippets which sort of show you your lifecycle actions uh, in all join. Uh, and this first one here is a description of how you connect your application to the all join bus. And all these code samples here are in Java, sort of written for Android. So hopefully those of you who are developers will find some of this familiar. 
So effectively what you have is you have your bus attachment um, uh, and you are registering a bus listener. And when you connect to the bus, you'll receive back a message indicating sort of what's happened. Uh, so the object represents your connection to the bus there. And that M bus, uh, usually you'll hang onto that inside your object in order to use it in the future. So it's almost, it's basically a singleton to the communication sort of mechanism. Uh, and then this is where you form your connection to the bus. So at the end of this, your M bus object basically is all you need to sort of carry on your communication and receive indications of what's happening from the network. Now, sorry, as I said, the font gets a bit smaller, so you have to look closely. I think the slides will be made available afterwards. You're going to make great. So you, if, if you're having trouble reading this, I'm sorry. The slides will be made available to you later so you can have a closer look. Um, so in this example here, this is sort of how you register a bus object. So once you've got your object that you want to kind of make available to other people using all join, this is an example of how you go about doing that. So firstly, you need to have an interface. So you can see here, you've got your interface being set up. So this is a very, very basic object, okay? Now, in all join, you'll see that there's a little annotation here called bus interface, okay? And this is something that the all join framework gives you, uh, which basically uh, facilitates the process of creating all join interfaces. So these annotations are sort of indications to the all join system that that's, this is gonna be an all join object. Uh, inside your interface, you then uh, specify your methods. And in this example here, you have a bus method. And you can see another annotation there basically indicating that this is a bus method. Uh, the signature argument there again, that says which, what arguments you're going to pass uh, in this object. And you can see here that the argument being passed is a string. And so the signature has been specified as x for string. Now, th this is not strictly necessary. Um, because what all join will do, this is kind of, I guess, uh, expanded for the purposes of the example, but uh, all join will automatically detect what the arguments to the method are and will use that to create the signature for you. So generally speaking, you won't need to do this. There are very specific instances where you have complex objects that you're passing backwards and forwards that you may need to add annotations to explain why or sort of what the objects actually are. Um, but this is basically just so you can see what's going on. Uh, then you have your implementation of the interface here, okay? And as you can see, you're inheriting from the bus object uh, uh, interface there, uh, but basically your actual method itself, there's nothing special about it. It just behaves as a normal method, and all join and that bus object implementation worries about all the rest of the stuff for you. And finally, uh, once you've created the object uh, for the service, uh, which do here in your, in your main code. You can then, using the nbus object, if you remember back to the previous slide, that's the global, not the global object, but the kind of the, the attachment to the bus that you need. You call this method to register the object and you give it a location in this shared namespace so that other people who are on the bus can find this object by name. Now you remember I referred to there being several possibilities for how you would uh, share data. Uh, one of the uh, things you often want to do is you want to be able to send signals out to everybody who's on the original bus for some reason, or, or for anyone who's interested. And so this is an example of how you create what's called a signal, uh, a, a signal and signal handler. Uh, so again, we have an interface here being defined. Uh, bus interface, again, is exactly the same. You'll notice though here that the annotation being applied to the method is slightly different. Okay? It's called a bus signal. Okay? So instead of a bus object, you use bus signal. And that indicates to the all joint system that this is going to be an asynchronous method that's just going to broadcast things that doesn't, uh, uh, but, but won't, um, there's, no, there's no argument. Uh, for, uh, there's no, sorry, there's no return value. Uh, so basically, the bus then has to know uh, what's going to um, handle the signal. Uh, so in this context here, uh, this object, the this, the this object in this context has a signal method handler, okay? Uh, and that's sort of how it deals with that. And this is where the implementation is. So this is the signal method here. So these two things are two sides of the same kind of coin. The, the transmitter of the signal is here, okay? The receiver of the signal is here. Okay. 
So whenever this signal is sent out, whenever the signal method is called to indicate that an asynchronous event has taken place, every object that's in the all join system uh, that has basically registered a signal handler uh, listening to that signal will have this method call. Right? So it's a very easy way of triggering uh, some behavior as a result of something that happens on the bus. Okay? Um, finally, this is how you advertise uh, names. Um, so uh, name advertising uh, is uh, when, when you start the system up by default, you'll have a name assigned to you, but that name is just a hash, um, which is not well known. Uh, so if you have an app that you're developing of some kind, you'll want to give it a name. And traditionally, the way we do this in all join is very similar to the way you name uh, Java uh, classes is its name as a, your domain name effectively in reverse order. Uh, so you can see here, basically, the registration taking place with the com all joint org sort of name. So when you advertise that name, um, you're also able to specify which kind of transports you want this to be available over. So if you have something that's only going to work over Wi-Fi, you can specify that. Um, in this context, we're saying it's available over all transport players. Um, so once, uh, yeah, once the name has been uh, registered uh, and it's advertised to everybody on the network, uh, you can't reuse it. Uh, you can't uh, if, if you can't uh, if yeah. So you need to make sure that when you finish using something like this, uh, if you fail to advertise the name here, it's important that you release it. The reason why is as soon as you basically made an advertise name call. All join effectively reserves that name for your use. So if you don't release it, then other people who come along who might be also instances with your app trying to basically register this name won't be able to do it. Uh, so it's important to make sure that you're releasing names and you don't pollute effectively the, the all join namespace uh, by, not, by not releasing them when you finish with them. Anyway, so this is the advertising that takes place. Um, and uh, this is an example of then the other side of that. If you want to discover uh, an application running on a different device, how you go about doing it. Uh, so this is effectively your listener, which you attach to the bus. Okay? Uh, when you do, if you remember at, at the start, we had an, uh, the MBUS object. Uh, basically the idea is that that, in, that that effectively inherits this, when you register it, you apply the local bus system to it. I think, if we go back a few slides, and if I can find it, you will see that the local uh, see. Yeah, so here you see this here. When you created your MBUS, you register a listener at that time when you create effectively your MBUS object. Uh, and that bus listener is what we're looking at right now. This object here is where you receive indications about what's taking place on your joint bus. Okay? Uh, and so you, you implement that. Let me hop forward back to the slides we're on. Uh, when you implement that, This is the implementation here of, of that sort of class, this local bus listener. So uh, when you advertise names or the name, the, uh, name changes or wherever it is, uh, this is the thing that's called, this is effectively the object instance that's called into. Um, and this is where you get informed about service arrival and departure. Uh, so here you can see that you make a call to MBUS to find that name, uh, which is the advertised name that's happened in the last slide. So you do a search for that by doing this, you know, trying to find it on the list on the bus. Uh, if it's successful, so if uh, it manages to find um, the object on the bus, uh, then you effectively, effectively you have your two ends of the bus, so you know what you're, you're able to communicate with. Uh, you've also got the idea of creating sessions. Now, as I said to you initially, sessions are important uh, if you want to basically create something that's private to a group of people who are on your joint bus. And session management is how you do this. Uh, now, one thing I'll say at this time is that when I wrote these, uh, this was the way you did session creation, and it's quite lengthy and verbose. There is now a much simpler way of doing session creation. Qualcomm has taken this code, boilerplate code, and have turned it into something that's much easier to use. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you what that is a bit later on, uh, if I remember, remind me when I finish. Uh, but session creation has been made a lot simpler. Uh, there's, a, there's a new class to basically facilitate that the problem's made available. Uh, so anyway, this is how you create it. So you have to have a listener for session events so that when sessions are created, you effectively get indications of what's happened. 
Um, you create a session basically based on session options. Uh, now you'll recognize here there's this funny kind of port number here. Um, if you remember in uh, TCP IP networking, you normally have a port of some kind to indicate where a service is going to be. Uh, so sessions in all joint have the same kind of idea uh, that you create sort of a community, you know, effectively your all joint endpoints are like IP addresses uh, and your session endpoints are like port numbers in, uh, you know, in the TCP IP. Uh, so that's kind of a way you can conceptually think about it. Uh, so effectively what you're going to do here is you create a session based on that. Uh, you set a bunch of options up here indicating uh, the proximity, the transport layer, the sorts of things you want to, uh, the characteristics of the devices which are able to connect to that session. Uh, and once you've done that and connected it, um, you then uh, have a uh, connection set up, which happens in the same sort of way. You specify a port uh, to indicate which uh, sort of session you're going to join up with. Um, you make a request to join the session. Okay? And effectively, then the other side, uh, the application is the one that determines whether or not you're allowed to. Okay? So the accept session joiner is called, uh, and at that point it decides whether or not um, uh, you should be permitted to join that session based on some decision the application has to make. Uh, it returns true or false on that basis to say, yes, this person can join the session, or no, this person can't join the session. Uh, and when that's happened, then you end up with your sort of, sorry, with your, with your bus connection uh, at each point. So this guy then knows that he's connected to the session, this guy uh, is indicated that the session has been joined. Okay? So session establishment is quite a tricky thing in order, as I said, it's been made a lot easier now, but that sort of gives you some idea of, of sort of how sessions are established. How are we doing for time? How many? Five minutes, okay, good. So I'm just gonna uh, move through the last couple of slides here reasonably quickly to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions if you'd like. Um, how do you add all joining to an Android application? The code samples I showed you are great for that. Uh, so uh, you know, there's at least a starting point for you. Um, but what are the sort of uh, facilities that are available to help you do that? Uh, well, really, where I'd advise you to go first is to go to the all join website. Um, the documentation that comes with all join is very good and very complete. You can obviously get the source code for all join which will help you to understand some of the internals of it. But if you just want to get started at the sort of higher level to understand how it all plugs together and how it connects together, um, then the documentation and the development guide for Android is very, very good. Uh, so I'd certainly encourage you to start with that and have a look at that. Um, you basically import the all join libraries. Uh, there are some manifest um, modifications required in order to allow all join to communicate with other uh, use sort of facilities on the device and stuff like that. Uh, and then you add your all joint code um, to your application. Uh, bits of which will probably go, you know, uh, in your sort of main event loop. Um, other bits uh, which will sort of be distributed through your application depending on how you want to do things, uh, you know, when sessions are established or send out signals and stuff like that. Um, but that's basically all there is. The, the commissions required, uh, you know, there's you obviously have to add quite a few of them, particularly to do with uh, multicast, uh, Wi-Fi and stuff like that, and some of the commissions sometimes. Uh, but the documentation has a lot of detail about what you need to do to set that up. Um, it is possible to add all join if you are OEM or you're specifying uh, requirements to OEM, so in other words, you're helping somebody build a phone effectively. It is possible to add the all join daemon as a start process. So that when the device starts up, the all join daemon is, is, uh, is done. Um, this is not a typical thing to do if you're a developer, um, but if you're doing a lot of development, you might change your device so that all join daemon is running the whole time. Um, the benefit, of course, is that it means that you don't have to include uh, the, the all join code, the all join daemon isn't started then in your application, it's started externally, and all the applications on the device can kind of share a connection with that daemon. Basically, how it works is when all joint starts up, it checks to see if there is a daemon running on the system. If there isn't, then it instantiates its own. Uh, so this is one way you can do that. Um, uh, I mean, the, the important thing to note here is this one here, that if there's lots of all joint interactions, you've got to be very careful 
because delays to how it uh, does things can delay, you can delay the UI thread. So make sure you get it out of the UI thread really quickly. Uh, so that's basically it. The, the, thing, the other thing to note is that uh, device resources are actually very, very well maintained at all join. It's not wasteful on, on, on the device. Obviously, uh, the Wi-Fi protocol in general is, is quite wasteful for sort of look for devices. But all join itself doesn't really add much to that. So um, I think it's, uh, it's very good from that perspective. Uh, finally, I'll just talk very briefly about how you add all join to a Unity application. Um, uh, basically, Unity has these things called it stopped working again. <laughs> Sorry, my uh, slideshow is, my controller is not working too well. Uh, to add it to a Unity application, um, uh, you can basically do it for Android or the Windows desktop right now, but iOS support for all join Unity is not uh, complete yet, it's still in development. Uh, you can get documentation in the same location, the alljoin.org website, um, and there's what's called a prefab, which is effectively like a uh, like an extension to your development environment, which you drop into Unity in order to enable the functionality. Um, you still need to modify your manifest, um, but then you use C Sharp to basically do your all joint functionality and connectivity. So, um, and I think that's basically it. So, is there any questions I can answer for you? How much, what's the time now? Are we? Oh, we five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So, if anyone has any questions, if you have five minutes now, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hopefully, I can answer. Yes? Uh, question. Uh, on the slides, you showed us a two way connection like for the two devices. Yeah. But how do you make it you know, the group bigger and communicate with the bus? Is it yep. the same way? Yeah, so let me go back to the session. Yeah, I'll go back to the session slide because that's probably the most relevant one. Uh, I mean, the session, this session connected here is probably the. But basically, the challenge you have when you design an application like this is who's in charge? Okay, so if you have 10 devices, you've got to have a device effectively which is in charge of the session. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of something you have to figure out in your application design is how you pick which device is going to be the one who's, who's in charge of the session. But once you have a device which is in charge of the session, any other devices which come along run through the same system here to become part of, uh, part of the session. So they follow through the same client code here, this, this sort of code here, in order to attempt to join the session. And then the person, the device which has been effectively elected as the session manager is the one that controls whether or not that yes, the devices are allowed to connect to the, to the application. So there's literally no technical limitation coming from all join yep. in regard to the number of devices which should can connect. Uh, there's um, probably a restriction coming from uh, Wi-Fi. Because you need Wi-Fi, right? But, um, I mean, we use the examples uh, that you use uh, all join um, in the educational space, and there you can easily connect, let's say, 20 or more devices um, to, to uh, interact. Yeah. yeah, so there's not, a, I don't think there's any big limitations to it, but obviously the technical challenge is how you sort of maintain the session and who's elected to this sort of magic. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Um, hello. Uh, hello. Actually, I have two questions. Go ahead. Uh, both taking that business perspective. <coughs> From the technical side, we have, we have uh, been playing with uh, Audio uh, for nearly two years. Oh, great. Right. Okay. Good. Uh, and actually, we are using Audio in our application too. Uh -huh. uh, we built a uh, local uh, Skype application, which does not need an internet connection. Right. <laughs> Good. Uh, but we have an issue. Uh, the first one is uh, since we keep the connection uh, up yep. with the Audio peers, uh, we, we have to keep the Wi Fi network. Yep. Uh, which drains the battery too much. Okay. So uh, we have a technical issue uh, yep. uh, in this question. How, uh, the first one, how do you address this uh, issue uh, on framework? Yeah. Yes. And yep. the second one is, since it's peer-to-peer -peer and it does not need uh, the internet, uh, we, 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 are, uh, we try to make a business model on, on it, but uh, it's, it's so hard to create a business model without the internet. Since you, you couldn't advertise the device, it, it does not need a connection. Uh, you could not uh, rely on subscription based applications and etc. Uh, yep. how, how do you address it too? Yep, okay. So, on the first one, uh, it sounds to me like you probably know more about the technical depth of all joint than I do. <laughs> <laughs> if you've been playing with it for two years, that's great. Um, 
So uh, maybe it's best if I try and connect you with the right person on the all join team to make those questions, because that's a very, very valid question. Uh, we've had you know, other issues with session management, which I think has been resolved with some development, but that's a good technical question, which I, I think is probably better to have someone in the main development team answer. On the business side, that's a good question. I mean, we found the same thing. I mean, I think, let me give you my personal view on it. My personal view is that um, I think uh, the way to make money out of applications like this has to be some kind of upfront purchase mechanism of some kind. Um, I don't think things like Skype, you know, th their business model is different because they, they're able to use it and it's free and stuff like that. Um, I think the peer-to-peer -peer chat sort of space uh, without the internet is quite challenging. Um, and I don't, I don't, I mean, we, our, our application wasn't very successful, um, and I'm not, not sure what your commercial experience has been, but I imagine it's quite challenging. I think the main area where these sorts of applications are useful is in specific vertical markets. So whether it's education, uh, you know, communicating in a classroom environment, something like this, where people who are too shy to ask questions can, can write the question, and I can, I can see it that you're asking the question here, and I can address it this way. Uh, or uh, business environments where you want to share access to a particular piece of information to people in a room. I think these are the spaces where those sorts of applications would be most useful. Um, I think in the general case, it's hard. Um, but I can see in some environments, interesting, I've had some, we've had the people who install our app mainly are in countries where communicating over the internet is seen as risky. Um, and, and we're having a secure environment that you know is not uh, easily tackable uh, is, is, is good for people. So that, that's my answer to that one. It's where I've seen people install it, people in states where you, you don't feel you have the freedom to express things over peer-to-peer -peer internet. Sort of. yeah. Let me also comment on this business question. So we do see a couple of commercial apps uh, taking about advantage of all joint in order to provide uh, this uh, functionality. Uh, so, um, for example, we with uh, or one of our partners um, um, has a business card reader, and they are, um, they've uh, implemented all join in order to facilitate um, exchange, electronic exchange of uh, scanned business cards. This is one feature added to the existing product. So the product itself is a premium App, which they sell for a certain price, uh, they don't charge uh, specifically um, for this additional feature. This is more kind of add-on, so it becomes quite tricky um, if you want to explicitly uh, charge this feature because um, you also need to educate um, the end user on the value which is delivered by uh, all join. So, um, I, I, I would agree that in most cases um, it's added to the existing app in order to, to um, make uh, the overall app more attractive rather than um, being commercialized as a, um, as a standalone feature. So being a secondary is an option, the secondary feature is well, the secondary feature, but the core businesses can operate to interact. No, it's not about the internet, but uh, what I'm saying is um, the app itself is sold. So it's not that you uh, just take this uh, all join feature and um, uh, charge on top, but it's more that uh, the entire app is charged. I mean, this is what our partners do. We are providing the technology, and so, so far, most of the partners um, uh, just implement it into the premium app and then sell this. Yep. Uh, is it possible to gauge the signal strength in this uh, system so that, for instance, we can create um, a virtual map of the, the peers uh, by uh, triangulation of cities? Yeah, I, it's not something that's offered in the framework right now. Um, there is, uh, as you saw in one of the slides, there is a, a proximity argument that you can apply to your session establishment here. Um, and this, at, on some networks where this information is available, you can, you can only allow connections to people who are in a certain radius of that can run. Um, but in terms of the signal strength, because it's transport layer independent, uh, you would need to query 
and, and the signal strength issue varies between Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, yeah. other protocols. It's not so easy to do that. It's probably something you have to implement on a transport by transport sort of basis. So I, I, this is a tricky, tricky one. Uh, the other yep. question is, uh, if they're using Bluetooth, uh, yep. and when you were in your first slides, there was something about pairing. Yes. And um, do we get all that problem? Right, so um, that's a good question again. All join, uh, in the initial form of all join, the, I think it was one version of it, Bluetooth was seen as a key kind of uh, driver. Um, to, do, to use all join over Bluetooth does require you to add permissions to the device, which are, I think, in excess of permissions that you're able to do as an application developer. So you need to switch on a Bluetooth uh, permission um, that is, uh, that I think, requires device or manufacturer permissions, if you know what I mean, device authority. You have to have either the manufacturer has to switch it on, uh, or Google has to switch it on. But I don't think there's an application developer you can. Um, but I need to check that. So I will, I will look and I will, I will tell you. But I, 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 do you think Bluetooth, for instance, Bluetooth 4 now is, is amazing in terms of the low energy? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And everything. So do you intend to keep it at the core of this application? Uh, I can't answer word map questions about Bluetooth because I yeah. don't know uh, is the honest answer. Um, Wi-Fi is the one that most work is going on, yeah. but uh, Bluetooth low energy is obviously something that I think they're looking at, but I don't know. I, I, have to, again, I have to go back and ask the product manager that question. Okay, thank you very much everybody. Oh, there is a, a present for me, thank you. No problem. This is for you guys. Now, I have to give this to the person who asked the best question. And I think, sir, that you asked the most good, a good question. The most beneficial and most uh, important. So that's uh, that's for you. Thank you very much, everybody. There's two more presentations from me this afternoon uh, on uh, Euphoria and on uh, Gimbal. So uh, if you've enjoyed this, uh, I'll, I'll be on later this afternoon as well with two other technologies. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the show. <clears throat>